On this Thursday night, the FBI foil a plot to kidnap Michigan's governor. I never could have imagined anything like this. The 13 militia group members charged, the elaborate plans they allegedly made, and how President Trump is accused of being complicit. Stand back and stand by, he told them. Another potential disaster, Canada's long-term care homes aren't ready for a second wave of COVID-19. Powering up the production of electric vehicles, the government investment in a made-in-Canada solution. And defending the earth. We have to have a decade of, of change. The prize from a prince to save the planet. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We are going to get to the spread of COVID-19 here in Canada in a moment, in particular the outbreaks in long-term care homes. But we begin with stunning allegations about a plot to overthrow the state government in Michigan, to kidnap the governor, attack the police, and attempt to ignite a civil war in the U.S. Thirteen men have been charged. The FBI alleges they had been planning for months and intended to execute the attack before the November presidential election. The FBI quotes one of the accused saying Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has no checks and balances at all. She has uncontrolled power right now. All good things must come to an end. Today, Whitmer accused President Trump of stoking their anger. When our leaders speak, their words matter. They carry weight. When our leaders meet with, encourage, or fraternize with domestic terrorists, they legitimize their actions, and they are complicit. Anger has been simmering for months. In April, gun-toting militiamen crowded into Michigan state legislature, angry about coronavirus restrictions. And just this week, the Department of Homeland Security warned domestic terrorism and violent white supremacy is the most persistent and lethal threat to the U.S., Today, Michigan State Police had a message for militia groups. We took an oath to protect and defend and to serve, and together we will take swift action against anyone who is planning or seeking to commit violence or harm to anyone in the state of Michigan. The alleged plot was elaborate and chilling. Eric Sorensen has our top story tonight. Hatred. Bigotry and violence have no place in the great state of Michigan. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer has been in the center of very public political unrest. The shocking scene of gun-wielding protesters entering the Michigan state capitol in April over COVID-19 lockdowns. But more shocking was something not happening in public, says the FBI. A plot to kidnap, possibly kill the Michigan governor before next month's U.S. election. Six men have been charged with plotting with a militia group to kidnap Whitmer and overthrow the government. The alleged conspirators are extremists who undertook a plot to kidnap a sitting governor. Because of the hard work of the men and women of law enforcement, police officers and federal agents, violence has been prevented today. The federal affidavit says there were undercover agents and informants and recordings made. It says some in the group engaged in tactical training and building explosives. One plan? Kidnap the governor at her personal vacation home. One accused, Adam Fox, described a snatch-and-grab man. Grab the effing governor. Just grab her. The plan then to remove the governor to a secure location in Wisconsin for some kind of trial. Among the accused is Brendan Caserta, who the Detroit News has identified as the man featured in a number of online video rants on TikTok. The price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Seven others also face state charges, bringing to 13 in all the number arrested. I'll be honest, I never could have imagined anything like this. Whitmer praised the police, but the Democratic governor then turned to the U.S. president. Donald Trump tweeted earlier this year, liberate Michigan. In the recent presidential debate, he suggested one right-wing group to stand by. Hate groups heard the president's words not as a rebuke, but as a rallying cry. This expert on counterterrorism suggests right-wing groups believe they have Trump on their side and some could resort to violence. A lot of us have been worried about the atmosphere in the United States leading up to the election in November and the fact that there are hundreds hundreds of right-wing groups that uh, are against a whole bunch of things. U.S. Homeland Security said this week that white supremacist extremists will remain the most persistent and lethal threat in the homeland. And many Americans are concerned with President Trump's troubled re-election bid now in the home stretch. Eric Sorensen, Global News. 
Let's go to our Washington Bureau Chief Jackson Prosco. Jackson, this is chilling stuff. You might expect to hear something from the American president after the FBI foil a plot to kidnap a governor. Has there been any response from the White House? Well, Donna, I can tell you the White House press secretary has gone on record as accusing Governor Whitmer of sowing division. And this morning, before those charges were announced, the president did phone into Fox Business Channel, where he called Whitmer the lockup queen over coronavirus restrictions and suggested that she's effectively keeping her citizens in prison. This really sort of comes as the president continues this kind of dance with the far right and with militias. Think about his reluctance to condemn white supremacists after that first presidential debate in which he told them to stand back and stand by. And then think about the language Trump has used, lines like liberate Michigan. You also don't have to look much further than the Trump campaign itself. Take a listen to this Facebook post from the president's son about what Trump supporters he says should be doing on election day. The radical left are laying the groundwork to steal this election from my father, President Donald Trump. Their plan is to add millions of fraudulent ballots that can cancel your vote and overturn the election. We cannot let that happen. We need every able-bodied man, woman to join Army for Trump's election security operation. So there's sort of a sense that the president is trying to play to all sides here. But Donna, this flirtation with the far right is actually potentially very damaging to the president because it risks scaring off the moderate Republicans who he needs, especially to overcome his current deficit in the polls. Uh, Jackson, there's been a lot of back and forth over a second presidential debate now that President Trump has been infected with COVID-19. What's the latest? Is it going to happen? Much like his flirtation with the far right, the coronavirus is the one thing the president doesn't want to talk about. And so when the Presidential Debate Commission proposed making the next debate a virtual format because of the virus, the president backed out. And then we had this sort of day-long back and forth with him and Joe Biden, both proposing all sorts of different ways to carry on with further debates. The long story cut short is that it's not certain we will see any further debates, Donna, and that is potentially very risky for President Trump here because he really needs something to turn around his campaign at this point. Without a debate, he doesn't have a chance for sort of a breakout moment in the home stretch of this campaign. Uh, Jackson, there's been a lot of back and forth over a second presidential debate now that President Trump has been infected with COVID-19. What's the latest? Is it going to happen? Much like his flirtation with the far right, the coronavirus is the one thing the president doesn't want to talk about. And so when the Presidential Debate Commission proposed making the next debate a virtual format because of the virus, the president backed out. And then we had this sort of day-long back and forth with him and Joe Biden, both proposing all sorts of different ways to carry on with further debates. The long story cut short is that it's not certain we will see any further debates, Donna, and that is potentially very risky for President Trump here because he really needs something to turn around his campaign at this point. Without a debate, he doesn't have a chance for sort of a breakout moment in the home stretch of this campaign. Okay, Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked today about the U.S. election and said he's hoping for a smooth transition or clear results, but is preparing in case that doesn't happen. What happens in the United States uh, is going to be impacting Canada. We are certainly all uh, hoping uh, for a smooth transition or a, a clear result. If it is less clear, there may be some disruptions and we need to be ready for any outcomes. The Prime Minister said he would not comment on specifics of the U.S. electoral process. One of the world's leading medical journals, which has never supported or condemned an American political candidate, has published a piece headlined, Dying in a Leadership Vacuum. The 34 editors of the New England Journal of Medicine don't name President Trump, but say the pandemic has been a test of leadership and U.S. leaders have failed. They have taken a crisis and turned it into a tragedy. The editors say when it comes to the response to the largest public health crisis of our time, our current political leaders have demonstrated that they are dangerously incompetent. We should not abet them and enable the deaths of thousands more Americans by allowing them to keep their jobs. The U.S. has the most confirmed cases and the most deaths from COVID-19 in the world. More than 212,000 Americans have died. Well, the wait is finally over for thousands of Canadians separated from loved ones who live overseas. Cross-border travel restrictions were lifted today for a range of family members. They include romantic partners of at least a year, siblings, grandparents, grandchildren, and those seeking entry to Canada on compassionate grounds. People must apply for and be granted travel authorization before coming to Canada. Ottawa has not released an estimated timeline for those approvals. 
There are signs a second wave of COVID-19 is beginning to hit long-term care homes in parts of this country, despite the promises to protect the most vulnerable and improve conditions and staffing levels in care homes. It seems not enough has been done. As of yesterday in Quebec, there were active cases in 79 private seniors' homes and long-term care facilities. Ontario is now reporting active outbreaks in 57 facilities. And Ontario's patient ombudsman is warning more must be done to avoid another long-term care catastrophe. In a new report that documents hundreds of complaints, the ombudsman says patients and their families were essentially set adrift when the pandemic hit in the spring. As Ross Lord reports, there are fears some facilities are headed down that same disastrous path now. With dozens of long-term care homes in Ontario reporting COVID-19 outbreaks in recent weeks, many in the healthcare system suggest conditions are about the same as they were in the spring. My fears are that, uh, you know, we haven't learned any lessons and we're going to see another wildfire spread of the pandemic that residents and workers are going to lose their lives at a greater rate than what we saw in the first pandemic. The province's long-term care association says some new measures are in place to control the virus, like more cleaning. We've reduced uh, uh, staff to only working in one, one health care site, and we've reduced occupancy admissions into these three and four bedrooms uh, and readmissions into those rooms. So starting to, to certainly ensure that there are no more than two people in a room. Duncan says staff and residents still need faster test results and better personal protective equipment. In a new report, Ontario's patient ombudsman recommends visits by a limited number of essential caregivers, dedicated resources for communication among patients or residents, families and staff, enhanced whistleblower protection, and contingency plans for all health care providers, including a staffing plan for COVID-19 outbreaks. But Plan A is getting more staff to replace frontline workers who left their jobs. We believe that we still have thousands of people at home. Fears of a devastating second wave are spreading across Canada, even inside the so-called Atlantic bubble. New Brunswick had very few COVID-19 cases until an outbreak this week at a long-term care home in Moncton. Anne-Marie Johnson is afraid her mother, Huguette, will contract the virus. I don't want to lose her. That My whole family doesn't want to lose her. We lost our dad going on two years in January, and she's the heart of our family. Back in Ontario, there are doubts a temporary pay raise of $3 an hour for personal support workers will make any difference. Their union says only offering more full-time jobs with benefits will bring workers back and attract others, so homes have better odds of suppressing the virus. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. And key to keeping vulnerable Canadians safe is getting community outbreaks under control. That's not happening right now in parts of Quebec and Ontario. Quebec has moved more areas into the red zone. That's its highest alert level. And police checkpoints are being set up to crack down on non-essential travel. For this long weekend, Quebecers are asked to be very, very careful. Together, we can break this wave. More than 1,000 people tested positive today in Quebec and in Ontario. There was a record daily spike, nearly 800 new infections there. There were 67 new cases reported in Manitoba today, 18 in Saskatchewan. 110 new cases were reported in B.C. and Alberta reported its biggest single-day increase today. 364 new infections, 274 of those are in Edmonton. People in that city are now being urged to limit gatherings to 15 people and to wear masks at indoor workplaces. I am very concerned about the sharp rise in cases that we are seeing. Over the past week, the positivity rate has increased to 4% in Edmonton. The Edmonton zone now faces a crucial juncture. While the system is able to support the current caseload in hospitals and ICUs, the acute care impact is a lagging indicator. Canada's Privacy Commissioner says the pandemic has accelerated the need for better laws on privacy and data use in this country. Daniel Tyrion tabled his annual report in Parliament today. He says most interactions online, from working remotely to socializing, logging into school or discussing health issues with a doctor, use commercial video conferencing technology. And he says there's a risk third parties could capture sensitive information. I'm frustrated for uh, Canadian citizens 
firstly. So Canadian citizens have less privacy protection than citizens of uh, about 40 countries that there's no reason why. The federal COVID alert app, though, has been praised for its privacy measures, but Tyrion says there must be ongoing monitoring to ensure third parties don't get access to it and push users to disclose information. The new jolt to making more electric vehicles in Canada. Coming up, the cash injection to fuel a greener future. The federal and Ontario governments are teaming up to provide the Ford Motor Company with a combined $590 million to produce electric vehicles in Oakville, Ontario. As our chief political correspondent David Aiken explains, Premier Doug Ford and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau aren't political allies, but they do seem to be kindred spirits in some ways these days. The cars of the future zero-emission electric vehicles, and Ford Motor Company wants to build them. To do that, Ford will get some financial help, $295 million each from the governments of Canada and Ontario. The car maker will then kick in $1.4 billion of its own to start producing electric vehicles by 2024. This will support and protect our auto, auto sectors made in Ontario advantage. And it will help support good paying jobs for Ontario families and workers for years to come. But also good jobs elsewhere. These cars, for example, will need aluminum from BC and Quebec. This investment will make a huge impact throughout the supply chain, including the many, many auto parts suppliers throughout the regions. This federal investment is part of the Trudeau Liberals' plan for a so-called green recovery. By investing in technology that protects the environment, we're also taking action on our plan to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And it's the latest example of two former rivals, a Liberal Prime Minister and a Conservative Premier, finding ways to work together. I think it's also deeply reassuring to know that in this time where there is so much uncertainty, People can have confidence in their institutions to focus on them and not focus on fighting each other. Finally, today's deal is one of the most tangible signs that the electric vehicle is moving into the mainstream. In fact, Ford says that within a decade, electric vehicles like this one are going to outsell the good old gas guzzler. Donna? Okay, David Aiken, thank you. Canada criticized still ahead accusations of a link to a violent regional dispute. The Turkish government is accusing Canada of double standards after Ottawa suspended the export of some military technology to Turkey. There are allegations Canadian-made equipment is being used by the Turkish-backed military in Azerbaijan. It's in a deadly conflict with Armenia over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh. As Redmond Shannon explains, both sides are ignoring international appeals for a ceasefire. After 26 years of relative peace, Nagorno-Karabakh is again at war. This footage purportedly shows Azeri forces attacking the region's capital on Sunday. Similar scenes of bombing in Azerbaijan's second city. Armenia denies targeting civilians, saying it had only shelled an airbase. The Nagorno-Karabakh tensions have their origins in the 1991 demise of the Soviet Union. When Armenia and Azerbaijan declared independence, the ethnically Armenian region legally remained inside Azerbaijan. A war ensued followed by a peace deal in 1994 that saw ethnic Armenians control Nagorno-Karabakh with support from Armenia. World powers are broadly remaining neutral, with the exception of Turkey, a military ally of Azerbaijan currently flexing its muscles across the region. On Monday, Canada suspended the export of some military equipment to Turkey after allegations that parts were being sent on to Azeri forces. The set of rules that we have under the law and the regulation require the Minister of Foreign Affairs to look at a piece of equipment with respect to a destination, with respect to the use of the equipment and a hand user statement. NGO Project Plowshares says a drone video released by Azerbaijan strongly resembles those taken by sensors made by Canadian company Wescam in Burlington, Ontario. Wescam declined to comment to Global News. I would be astonished if Global Affairs did not have an idea that Turkey was actually misusing these weapons earlier. 
The export suspension came after lobbying from Canada's large Armenian community. Turkey has accused Ottawa of a double standard because Canada continues to export arms to Saudi Arabia despite its involvement in the war in Yemen. I would actually agree with, with the government of Turkey in coming out and saying there, there totally is a double standard. Canada's Foreign Minister Francois-Philippe Champagne is meeting European leaders next week to push for a ceasefire. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Earth shots wanted next, the royal drive to repair our planet. You're watching Global National. British broadcaster Sir David Attenborough has been warning for a long time that the Earth is at a tipping point. Now he's joined forces with Prince William to launch a $5 million competition called Earthshot. The idea is to spark and reward bright ideas and innovation to reverse the human impact on the planet. As Crystal Gamansing explains, people are being told to dream big. The Earthshot Prize is fashioned after John F. Kennedy's moonshot. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. Prince William is looking to spur action to benefit us all. Saving Earth and, 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 and really focusing our attention on, on doing really ambitious targets on Earth, much like the same way you put a man on the moon. Working with the Duke of Cambridge, Sir David Attenborough, a man dedicated to exploring and documenting our changing worlds. It's got a magic to it. Let's hope it has some magic touch. But that human touch has also been detrimental. Having watched so many David Attenborough documentaries recently with, with my children, they absolutely love them. But the most recent one, the extinction one, actually, George and I had to turn it off. We got so sad about it halfway through. And he said to me, he said, you know, I, I don't want to watch this anymore. It's just, why, is it, why has it come to this? It's a question and cause long championed by Charles, the Prince of Wales. We've forgotten sometimes, I think, that, that we are part of nature. So what we do to the world around us, we are doing totally to ourselves. The Earthshot Prize is focused on five areas. Reviving our oceans, restoring and protecting nature, fixing our climate, clean air, and building a waste-free world. Prince William and an international council, including environmentalists, celebrities, business leaders, and an astronaut, will decide which projects to support. It's a team. I, I, I've said to everyone so far that I'm I'm the uh, the very boring kind of like coach on the corner at the moment. If we all put our forces together for a common goal, we can make a great achievement. Earthshot Prize nominations open in November with the first set of one million pound awards being presented next fall. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this wheat field near Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, which is not far from the farm where I grew up. There are beautiful spots all over Canada. Please email us yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.